Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name's Trevor Broish. I'm Deputy Director of Crawford School. And uh, this is another in the school series of foundation seminars. Uh, Michael Wesley joined the school last summer uh, as Professor of uh, National Security Policy in the uh, National Security College, uh, which is now administratively within the school, uh, hence Michael's presence here at a, a Crawford School seminar. Uh, Michael, as I guess most of you know, uh, has an illustrious history of uh, uh, research and writing in areas of uh, international relations and, and policy. Uh, in particular, uh, he's written in areas of um, Australia's diplomatic relations with, with Asia, uh, but more widely than that, he's written in areas of um, uh, international policy in the Pacific, uh, questions of, of energy policy, of the uh, strategic and uh, um, other aspects of international trade agreements. Before coming here, uh, he was executive director at the Lowy Institute, so he's had a life in a think tank as well. Uh, before that, he was at uh, Griffith University. Um, that's his career as an academic. Uh, he also has an earlier career in the Office of National Assessments as a a public servant, um, interspersed with other academic appointments, going right back to the ancient history of a um, PhD from St Andrews in, in Scotland. Uh, I think Michael's well known to you, which is probably the reason that uh, you're all here. So I'm going to get out of the way and let uh, Michael talk on his topic. It's on the board, and the main theme is uh, Asia and the challenge of modernity. Thanks, thanks very much, Trevor. Um, thanks, everyone, for turning up, uh, which speaks to the quality of the sandwiches rather than uh, <laughs> what I'm actually going to talk about. Um, look, uh, I, take, I took very much the spirit of these foundation uh, seminars is for people to uh, put out um, big ideas um, and, uh, and to test them with an expert audience. Um, the expert audience is the main reason I came to the ANU. I can't imagine a richer uh, intellectual milieu in which to test out ideas. So I'm going to try and speak as little as possible, and I'm very interested in your comments and feedback on what I'm, what I'm about to say. Please take everything, uh, pretty much everything I say uh, today as a hypothesis. Um, I've, uh, I'm, I'm working on a book, uh, and uh, the ideas that I want to test out on you today are going to be a later chapter of the book, uh, one of the so what qu uh, chapters. The book is uh, actually on um, uh, the strategic dynamics uh, around the, the, you know, the, the rapid economic growth in Asia. And, uh, and basically the second last chapter is a so what question. And this is my testing of the so what ideas on you. Um, it actually, interestingly, also takes me back to on my own intellectual journey. Um, at the time when I transitioned from an undergraduate to a graduate student uh, was a time when the Cold War ended. Uh, no, many of the younger of you may, may think it was when the Second World War ended. No, it was actually <laughs> when the Cold War ended. And uh, there were two uh, very big ideas that were thrown into the, the intellectual milieu at the time. In 1989, Francis Fukuyama published an article in the journal The National Interest. He turned it into a book. It was called The End of History and the Last Man. Uh, two years, uh, sorry, four years later, uh, Samuel Huntington wrote an article in Foreign Affairs uh, called The Clash of Civilizations, and he was to later turn it into a best-selling book as well. A good example of on academic entrepreneurship, if ever there was one. But these two, uh, these two American scholars presented two very different views of what the world after the end of the Cold War would be like. Fukuyama, first of all, of course, famously argued that with the decline of communism in the Soviet bloc, uh, the, the humanity would march onwards towards the last viable ideological system, the last viable economic system, which was liberal democracy and free market economics. Um, 
So basically, he, he argued that with the decline of the great ideological competitions, basically, humanity would um, converge. That's probably Fukuyama calling, right? <laughs> <laughs> I apologise. Um, uh, humanity would converge on a single future, and the future would look very much like uh, the world that we live in in Western countries. Huntington, of course, whether or not he was actually provoked by Fukuyama uh, in, in, in making his argument, I'm not sure, but he argued completely the opposite. He said that with the decline of ideology, that there would be a rise in civilizational difference. Uh, and basically, he sketched out a very provocative thesis of the rise of a number of different civilizations, Sinic civilization, uh, uh, Islamic civilization, uh, Hindu civilization, uh, Japanese civilization, sub Saharan African civilization, and so on. He also famously argued that uh, the West is a civilization, that the West, he argued in a very famous line, the West was the West before it became modern. And we have to realise that what we regard as universal values in the world are actually Western values. And that when non-Western people uh, look at what we regard as universal values, they see Western values. So that was, that was, Huntington's, um, uh, that was Huntington's thesis. Now, importantly, this was important not only for me uh, as, a, as a scholar, but it was important because it brought back and brought to the public attention a much older controversy. And the controversy was basically um, first sketched out, or at least one of the most famous sketchings out, was uh, by an Australian scholar, uh, Hedley Bull. Uh, Hedley Bull first wrote about the importance of uh, a multicultural world uh, and what that would mean for world order. Hedley Bull wrote a very famous book called The Anarchical Society in which he, he argued that uh, we needed to look at the world as a society of states that were united by their agreement on certain rules of behaviour, certain rules of conduct in the world, and that the working of the world depended on the agreement of different states, of the, the world of states, on those rules of conduct. But in this book that he uh, edited along with Adam Watson, published in 1984, he said, what happens when an international order that was essentially conceived in Western Europe in modern times, that is, within the world of Christendom, within a single cultural region, single cultural zone, and then exported to the rest of the world as a series of empires, what happens when that becomes genuinely multicultural? What happens when decolonisation brings about a world in, what, in which all of the sovereign states, in fact, the majority of sovereign states, are not Western in culture, when they have different cultural traditions? And the big question posed in this book in 1984 is, can world order endure a multicultural world? Now, I think many of you will be sitting there and say, well... That's kind of a dumb question because now we've been living in a multicultural world for 40 or 50 years and obviously the world is working very well, thank you very much. Well, I, I happen to think that um, it's important to pose the question now again because there's something very different about the world that we're going into and the world that we're living in than the world that Bull looked at or, for that matter, the world that Fukuyama and Huntington looked at. The world that Bull uh, looked at and the world that Fukuyama and Huntington looked at was, were worlds that had been divided by an ideological dispute. And interestingly, if you go to the expansion of international uh, society and you read the chapters by a person called Ada Bozeman on uh, international order in a multicultural world, the argument is very much why have so many non-Western states adopted radical Marxist regimes? So arguably, the interculturality of the world was very much constrained by 
uh, by the ideological competition, by the subscription either to a, to a liberal democratic capitalist world or a communist world. Fast forward to the 1990s when Huntington and Fukuyama are writing and you have a series of wealthy states, particularly in our part of the world, but they're very much part of the American alliance system. You have a rich, powerful non-Western state in Japan, but it is part of an American alliance system and, in fact, um, is uh, very strongly locked into an American world order. What is different uh, here... And no, this is not a, a metaphor for the, you know, the, the forces inside the Crawford School. Um, <laughs> what is different here is that we have two, and possibly more, if you add Indonesia uh, into the mix, uh, we have two very, very big, rapidly enriching countries that are not committed to the American alliance system and are not committed to the Western world order. And so arguably we're going into a world that is for the first time genuinely multicultural in, a, in the sense that some of the most powerful countries in this world are not Western and are not committed to being Western. So let's go back to modernity. Um, in thinking about what's happening, what I want to set up here is a paradigm that looks at modernity on one hand and either westernisation or let's call it universalisation. Do you have to adopt basically the big question that confronted all uh, anti-colonialist modernisers uh, when they were hit by colonisation was, do you have to become Western in order to become modern? Do you have to become Western in order to be able to compete with the West? Now, quite interestingly, um, the, the most writing on the question of modernisation and modernity comes from sociologists. One of, the, one of the key early movers was Max Weber in writing on modernity, and there have been a number of uh, writers on modernity ever since. Now, <clears throat> arguably, um, I've tried to collect what they've said about modernity into this slide. Um, Weber said that modernity occurs in a society when the ideas that the order that, that exists um, is uh, preordained and is timeless, that is guaranteed by a god or spiritual forces, and that human beings are mere pawns in a cosmic game being played out. And Weber argues that once a society gets rid of that idea and says that it's human beings and intentional human action that makes history and that makes societies tick, that's when a society becomes modern. So the, right, the end of fatalism and the rise of human agency. Then comes, of course, the rational conquest of nature, uh, including human nature, quite interestingly, uh, the rise of rational <coughs> systems of ordering social life, uh, economics kicks in, industrialisation, high levels of structural differentiation in society and the economy, high levels of social mobilisation, urbanisation, the creation of massive working classes of people and society-wide centralised institutions. So those are all of the conditions that the great sociologists have written about in terms of modernity. And that what, that's what makes, um, you know... Uh, you know, 18th century or 19th century Britain very, very different from 16th century Britain, just as it makes uh, Maoist China very, very different from uh, Qing Dynasty China. All of these things uh, occur according to the sociologists. International relations has had a bit to say about, uh, about modernity as well. There is no question uh, that modern and some would say very culturally Western forms have influenced the non-Western world and been taken up very strongly by the, the non-Western world. The fact is that the form of the state, the sovereign state, is a Western European cultural invention that has been externalised to the rest of the world. There has been a universal adoption of the state form. We don't have empires anymore. We don't have 
principalities and, and, and city-states, apart from some anom anomalies in Europe, there is the state form and it has been uh, adopted around the world. There has been very, very strong subscription to Westphalian norms. In fact, uh, arguably, according to some theorists like a uh, former British diplomat, Robert Cooper, just when the West has moved away from strict ideas of state sovereignty and state prerogative into what he calls the postmodern state, the states in the rest of the world, particularly in our part of the world, have become very, very focused on sovereignty, uh, as we can see in the territorial disputes in our own region. Universal adaptation, uh, adoption, should I say, of urbanisation, education, forms of writing, monetization, Spreading institutionalisation, these states in the non-Western world creating their own regional institutions and subscribing to global institutions. The globalisation of the communications revolution, the fact is that two-thirds of mobile phone subscribers these days on Earth are non-Western. And finally, the rise of the Davos person, um, who, uh, don't snigger, I would include everyone in this room, an international elite, an international literate, English-speaking elite, uh, all university educated, all able to talk to each other uh, about similar things in similar terms. So basically, one way of looking at things is that there's nothing really to discuss here. That basically, as societies progressively modernise, they all become more and more similar. They all seem to adopt these forms, and ultimately Fukuyama was right, that there is a single modernity that everyone is starting to converge towards. Well, what I'd like to explore in uh, the 10 or so minutes I've got left is uh, a statement made uh, by a, sociology, a sociologist, S.N. Eisenstadt, um, who wrote about multiple modernities, who said, that it's a mistake to think that human beings will converge on a single modernity because what that implies is that uh, cultures will basically de de -culturate. They will lose their own culture in becoming modern and everyone will converge on a, on a similar blancmange. Interestingly enough, Fukuyama said the same thing. He said, a world in which the end, the, in which history is ended, in which everyone is a liberal democracy and a market economy is going to be incredibly boring. And I think that's what Eisenstadt might have said. But as we look around the world, we can see that despite different levels of modernisation, different levels of progress, we can see images and <coughs> scenarios that still... Um, make us think that the world is a very, very different place. Uh, the, the one here um, is, is an interesting one. This is a picture of Korean women after the, the Asian financial crisis donating all of their jewellery to the state. This was a big movement in Korea after the Asian financial crisis in that country. And it's a, it's a good question to ask. If Australia went through a similar Asian financial crisis crash, how many Australians would be lining up to donate their jewellery and all of their valuables to the Australian state? I'll leave that, uh, that to the Q&A, perhaps. Arguably, I think I would side uh, with Huntington. I would side with the fact that uh, modernisation does not uh, equate and will not necessarily equate to... Uh, the homogenisation of cultures, the homogenisation of cultures around universal values. This is uh, a diagram fr from Huntington's book. And basically, he sketches, for those of you who, who can't see it, uh, on, on the vertical axis is westernisation, um, uh, the progress towards westernisation. On the horizontal axis, the progress towards modernisation. And basically, Huntington sketches out several scenarios. There's one of the country that tries to tries very, very hard to westernise but makes no progress uh, in, uh, in modernisation. 
Uh, Axis C is a country that modernises quickly but maintains its own values. It doesn't westernise at all. Uh, there's a happy medium in B. But this one is the one that, uh, that line E, which, which is basically an inverted U form. It describes, and he describes this as the form that is going to happen increasingly in the world today. That a country uh, that wants to modernise uh, starts very slowly to adopt Western or universal ideals and structures. But that as it becomes more and more modernised, and therefore more and more wealthy and powerful, it will start to become de-Westernised. It will start to become much more distinctive. It will start to become much more culturally distinctive. And this is an argument, I guess, that has always, in, always intrigued me. There are a couple of things that Huntington says are behind this dynamic. One is a society level one, and one is an individual level one. The first one, the society level one, is that he says that as societies become more wealthy and more powerful, they suddenly become more and more proud of their own institutions. And they begin to reassert uh, their, the, the pride in their cultural institutions. At the individual level, and I think he was uh, probably thinking of fundamentalist movements, he says, as societies modernise, people become more and more individuated, more and more um, alienated, and therefore they gravitate towards fundamentalist, religious and culturalist movements. So that's uh, Huntington's idea. And, and what I'd like to do is just really briefly explore some of this idea. What I want to do is to look at what are the vectors or what are the indices along which uh, a society can choose uh, either to... What I mean by assimilation is basically westernisation or, or, uh, or movement towards what are the dominant global cultural forms and norms which are very westernised form versus differentiation which is adopting or reverting to or asserting very powerfully one's own cultural and civilizational forms. Now, I don't have a lot of time here, but um, I think that they fall across five vectors. The first one is a consumption vector, basically what individuals consume, be it food, be it forms of entertainment, be it forms of fashion and dress, uh, be it forms of... Uh, um, well, all of those things, I guess, be it forms of, you know, um, consumer items, uh, holiday destinations and so on. The second is the degree to which a society chooses to allow individual autonomy free reign, to allow individual preferences, to allow all sorts of lifestyle freedoms, to allow freedom of expression, to allow the criticism of the state, to allow the criticism of the dominant religion and so on. Uh, how far along this, uh, this realm does a society go? Third one is institutionalisation. I think one of the interesting things, particularly about our region, is the level to which the state and the power of the state is constrained or not constrained. What I'm talking about here is the willingness to institute very strong rules of democracy, rule of law uh, and civil rights domestically and the willingness to put the state into very powerful, compelling regional institutions as well. Arguably, that process is very advanced in Europe, very strong um, uh, domestic norms of, uh, of framing state power and state prerogatives, and very strong international norms or regional level norms of doing that as well. Arguably, that process is starting to develop in Latin America as well, and in, in Africa of all places. There are strong movements in that direction, particularly with the formation of the African Union. In the Asian region, while it is true that there are some very strong and very old democracies in the Asian region, uh, the fact is that there is no uh, regional level sanction against states that aren't democracies uh, and, and don't intend to democratise. 
and regional institutions are very weak in terms of being able to constrain state power. So to what level is a society willing to subject the power of the state to institutional checks and balances? Integration. Uh, by that I mean in the willingness to integrate into uh, global networks, networks of exchange, be they monetary networks of exchange, be they uh, the exchange of ideas and culture. And finally, down here, by acceptance I mean the willingness of a non-Western society to accept the normative basis on how the world is ordered. Who is wealthy in the world, who owns the majority of the assets, who owns, uh, who, who controls the universal or, or, or the world currency and so forth. So it's these axes that are, are, I guess are some of my hypotheses. Uh, to what extent do the various societies in Asia lie along these axes in terms of their willingness to assimilate to universal or global norms and ideals or the extent to which they are determined to stay differentiated. <clears throat> Integration versus differentiation, I think, uh, offers a range of alternatives. And there are incentives towards uh, both uh, of, of these. The integration incentives uh, are very quick. Basically, uh, if you accept and if you integrate with universal norms, your society has basic access. It has access to international trade, to international technology, to international knowledge. Uh, you are able, in economic terms, to access the scale of the international market if you're producing for the international market. Uh, you're able to access uh, international flows of investment and so on. And finally, uh, you are accepted. If you are seen to be becoming part of international norms, not bucking them, not challenging them, you are much likely, more likely to be accepted and therefore have a greater sense of security. On the other hand, the incentives towards differentiation. Basically, uh, these, these are four as I can see them. Firstly, uh, if you uh, continue certain levels of cultural differentiation in what you do, you're able to demonstrate a continuity with traditional structures, traditional ideas of social organisation, traditional ideas of cultural meaning and so on. It also uh, allows the state or the regime uh, to demonstrate legitimacy and to have uh, uh, authenticity in relation to the society's ideals. Often uh, states uh, play up their cultural uh, uh, singularity in order uh, to foster a sense of pride and prestige, particularly in a, in a golden age. Uh, of that state or that society or that culture in the past. And finally, uh, and uh, this will become clearer in a couple of slides' time, the prospects for a fairer status quo. If you don't accept the way that the world is ordered, if you are critical of the way the world is ordered, if you say it's unfair, then you're holding out to your own society the prospects that someday the world will be better ordered. So, arguably, the choice that every non-Western society makes is how does a modernising society mediate between integration and differentiation? How does it try and capture the benefits, to the extent possible, of integration while uh, capturing the benefits of differentiation? And those five axes that I sketched out, arguably, each of Asia's societies that is modernising has made different choices <coughs> along those axes. The trade-off, ultimately, uh, if you want to press it this way, is between viability and value. Viability meaning the ability of the state to maintain order within itself. If it presses too hard towards integration, if it rejects its own culture too radically, you will get a situation where society rejects the regime and chaos breaks out. On the other hand, if it becomes too nativist, if it becomes too differentiating, uh, it becomes unable to capture the value of being a part of a modern integrating world. 
The ability uh, to um, guarantee viability uh, is mediated by the basic cultures and structures. How amenable is one's own culture to modernisation processes? And that's something that Eisenstadt has written quite a bit about. Value, on the other hand, the ability to, to become wealthy and to become advanced is mediated by uh, location and resources. Quite simply, there are some countries that don't have to uh, integrate that, that much because of what they have, and I'm thinking here particularly of resource-rich states in West Asia. OK, coming uh, to the end, this is the last slide you'll be delighted to hear. Um, I think, ultimately, one should be able to map where various modernising Asian states uh, sit in terms of um, uh, modernisation and, uh, and universalisation of culture on the following um, uh, diagram. The, the vertical uh, um, continuum is between Kamalist. Now, between uh, Kamalist is a term that I've lifted out of Huntington's book. It basically describes Turkey uh, in, uh, after, the, uh, after the revolution, uh, the rise of modern Turkey under Kemal Ataturk, that basically said, in order to modernise, Turkey must adopt Western forms. And it was the radical rejection of, of traditional Turkish forms of culture. So that's basically uh, a complete adoption uh, in order to modernise of uh, universalist uh, Western forms. On the other hand, again, this is a Huntington term, is rejectionist. Those countries that have said, or those societies that have said, we completely reject the adoption of any Western forms, any universal forms, and therefore we will forego <coughs> modernisation as well. So that vertical axis is based on an idea that modernity is basically uh, equivalent to acculturation. In order to become modern, you have to acquire Western values. And on the one hand, there are societies that say, yes, we want to become modern, so we will adopt Western values. And on the other hand, you have those that say, we don't want to adopt Western values, and therefore we don't want to, we don't want to modernise. Horizontal axis is between adaptive and revolutionary. And basically, the, the idea here is that uh, modernity involves accepting the way that the world works. If you want to become modern, you have to accept the way that the world works, the way that wealth is, uh, is divided, the, world, the way that uh, the resources are controlled, uh, the way that the global economic system works, the way that global uh, institutions work, and so on and so forth. There are those countries that are adaptive that say, yes, we want to become modern, and therefore we will accept the way that the world works, versus revolutionary countries those that say, we will become modern, but in becoming modern, we will change the way the world works. I've had a bit of a go at, uh, at plotting various Asian countries uh, around uh, the, the different quadrants. As you can see, I adopt uh, a full uh, Mediterranean to the Pacific uh, view of Asia. Uh, you may disagree with that. I, I certainly hope you do. That's basically all I wanted to say. I've probably gone on a little bit too long. I'm, most interested in your comments and questions. Thank you.